Well, I was heading down towards the Horn and I made my landfall on Diego Ramirez Islands. And it had been blowing quite hard the day before. Well, that's fine. Now this time, you know, I'm not worried about that. We can just deal with it. And then it began to ease. And actually, I was flat becalmed off Cape Horn. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And you could see the black, dark clouds over Tierra del Fuego. I thought, there's something brewing up over there. I don't like the look of this at all. I want to get away from here. And it was the current that was taking me past. And I was a few miles south of it, but I could see it quite clearly. And uh, so I took some photographs just to show I'd been there. And um, of course, the next day I get an easterly gale from the wrong direction. So bashing away into this. And all I really want to do is get out of the Southern Ocean. And now I've got an easterly, for goodness sake, so I'm beating into it. And it was very cold. I remember standing in the hatch, you know, and just trying to keep my sinuses warm. After I'd round the horn, I said, well, now let's get round the horn. Let's get clear. I mean, my next thing is to get up the Atlantic. And so I'm already thinking that. Um, you know, it's yippee, yeah, great, celebrate, you know, open the box and have some cake. But that lasts only a very short space of time. Right, what's next? Let's, you know, don't, let's get too euphoric about it. We, we've still got a boat to sail. I, I think that attitude comes very much from the Merchant Navy, yes. I mean, your, your job is to get to port. And so, you know, you've got this and this and this, but actually you're thinking there. That's where I've got to get. And so, OK, I've got around this bit, but now let's get on with the next bit. And so you're, you're automatically sort of programmed to think that way. Look, the Southern Ocean is a miserable, cold place. Um, you get as big a wave as you'll find anywhere on the planet. Uh, the only other place which is as bad is the North Pacific, and they're very equal. When you get a big storm blowing in the Southern Ocean, you've got winds of 70 miles an hour. You've got waves being built up. You've probably, because the fronts come through very quickly, you know, one minute you're ambling along full sail set under a northwesterly, and the front comes through, and 10 minutes later it's force 10 from the southwest. Now you've got a mixed sea, and that's dangerous. And when these really big waves, we're talking about 30 meters, when you get a real blow and it's white with spin drift, but there's still the wave curling at the top, that is dangerous. And you have to get your boat right for that. And it took me a while to work on how to do it. I mean, I, in fact, so Hayley was actually damaged before I learned how to do it. I didn't know that at the time. I found it out later when I refitted it. I found two fractured frames. And I can remember when that happened. But it was a question of finding out how to get your boat to lie to those seas. And I found a system that worked beautifully for Sue Haley. She became really comfortable. You know, I eventually got it right. From then on, when it really blew, I was comfortable. I used to go to bed, just bounce through it. Waves might break over the boat, but I'm down below. I'm not going to get washed off. And I would get some good sleep. Uh, but it took time to work it out. Now, that worked for Sue Haley. That might not work for another boat. I mean, the modern open 60s, for instance, you just outrun it. Um, you've got the speed, the acceleration, and you can outrun the waves. But uh, with something like Sue Haley doing possibly five knots as opposed to 15, you, you can't outrun those waves. They're going to get you. And the small boats are going to be caught. And everyone's going to have to work out what's best for their own boat. My last money, I spent £16 on a coil of two-inch polypropylene. That was my last purchase. And thank goodness I did, because it was about 720 feet. And I used to put it out, both ends made files, put it out in a huge bite from the stern. That held the stern. So when you're, you're coming down a wave, the danger is the boat will accelerate down the front. As she does that, she lose steerage, and she's quite right to broach around in front of the wave. When that happens, the wave's going to roll you, and you lose your masts, as a minimum. If you can hold the boat steady, stern two, that isn't going to happen. And that warp allowed that to happen, so it just held her. 
and you could see the rope stretching quite a lot with the weight coming on. Suhail is 10 tons. But even so, it held that stern absolutely into those waves. And of course, having a pointed stern, the waves were split up either side. There was no transom for the waves to thump onto and push her. So frankly, she was an ideal shape. I, I mean, I was aware of the size of the waves. Um, I knew what they can be like down there. I hadn't actually experienced one that big, but I've been around Cape of Good Hope a few times, sailed around it as well. We've been around it in ships. Uh, and yet occasionally you get caught with a storm and you see some really big waves. So I was aware they were going to be there. And my previous experience of being just to let them take the sails off and leave her, just let her lie a hole. Well, that, that worked in the North Atlantic, but it didn't work in the Southern Ocean. And beam on, she was just getting bashed and bashed. I mean, it's like the wave I was talking about. And I realized I couldn't leave her like that. I had to find some other way of holding her. And it took me a little while, actually, to get that. And then eventually I came up with this idea of putting the warps out. I'm sure I'd picked it up from someone, and it was at the back of my mind. And I decided to try it, and it worked beautifully. Yeah, I had a sea anchor on board. I did use it once, but it got into such a tangle. It was an absolute sod to pull back in. So I only used it the once and never used it again. The warps were better. And the other thing about the warps was there was a bit of give in them. Sea anchor doesn't have so much give. So with the warps, she would just ease a bit. You know, it wasn't hard held against the wave. Uh, whereas a sea anchor, it holds you much harder. I kept the rigging fairly tight. If you have slack rigging, it's what I call the um, paper clip. How many times do you do that with a paper clip and it will break? And exactly the same happens with slack rigging. I had this with Clipper when the government surveyor ordered me not to tune the rigs properly and I said, they're slack. He said, you touch those and we'll remove your compliance certificates. And within the next two months, I lost two masts. And he was very lucky the underwriters didn't sue him. And you've got someone giving him instructions. He didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And I was saying, this is not safe. Because we know what we're doing, but well, he didn't. And that arrogance really angers me. You can't afford to be arrogant at sea. Well, we didn't have harnesses, you see, so I couldn't have clipped on. I did put rope around myself, um, sitting in the cockpit when it was really blowing hard. I mean, I'd put a rope around myself because the waves were coming over the boat and they could wash me off. And I did, I went out on the bowsprit once to do a job and I put a line on myself for that. But um, apart from that, no. But then, you know, I know Suhaili instinctively, I and mean, I know where to grab. I do it without thinking. And so, if the boat jerks, my hand will go instinctively to the nearest handhold. And it's because I knew my boat. And as I say, right at the beginning, as I said right at the beginning, one of the great advantages was I knew that boat. And I do think that gave me a huge benefit that people didn't realize. You know, if you sail back from India, 18, 20,000 miles, and you've helped build the boat, you know your boat. That, I think, was one of the reasons I got round. Well, I thought it was going to take 300 days. Um, and I might have done it in 300 had I not lost myself steering. Uh, just before I reached Australia. And that did slow me up a bit. But I always thought it was going to be about 300 days. So mentally you're attuned to that. You just say, well, it's going to take 300 days. And I knew what Suhaili's speed could be. Um, so I do remember some, a journalist saying to me, how are you going to manage being on your own? And I said, I have no idea. Uh, if I'm back in two weeks, I haven't. 
But, um, you know, like most people, how often are we actually completely on our own for a long period of time? And, and in my case, four and a half months with no contact whatsoever. But actually, you're just busy. You just get on with it.